No, I'm the official. I'm gonna welcome everybody. I don't, I don't know anything about mobility. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joe Zimmerman. I'm on Sugarland City Council in the at-large position two. And I'd like to welcome you all this evening. It's indeed my pleasure. This is the fifth in a six-part series. We've had, I think, some extraordinary participation and attendance. And I see a lot of the same faces I saw when we had the first one here. So, so thank you all for your dedication to, to wanting to be part of this. I'd like to start tonight and introduce some of the council members that we have. We've got uh, Councilman Steve Porter from District 1. We've got Harish, I'm going to introduce you as, as part of the committee. Uh, Bridget, Harish, and myself are all part of the land use committee on the, on the council side. We also have, I know I've seen some of the PNZ members here tonight. We've got board, some of the boards and commissions are here tonight. If you're on any of those City of Sugarland boards and commissions, PNZ, Zoning Board of Adjustment, and the Land Use Committee, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you all for, for your service. As you know, in the, in the first part of the series, we learned how land uses and development patterns impact mobility and, and access to the places that we go. We also learned how demographics and the, and the choices of the different generations were impacting that. One of our paramount objectives of the comprehensive plan is superior mobility, and that carries down into our city comprehensive mobility plan for superior mobility. Tonight, we're going to hear from guests that are going to speak to the different venues in mobility, and mobility is not just roads. It's, it's mobility the way the city has defined it in both our comprehensive plan and our comprehensive mobility plan is all forms of, of transportation. So without uh, any further ado, Christoph, could you come and please introduce our guest tonight? Okay. So our topic today is mobility and land use. What we're going to do today is have two different keynote presentations um, from Jeremy Nelson and Jeff Carlton. And then we're going to do a question and answer. Um, you'll be able to submit those on the blue cards you find here. You'll be able to submit them on Facebook, on Twitter, and via email. And then we're actually going to have a group activity so that all of you can both react to what you've seen here and give us some of your own thoughts for mobility in Sugarland. So as Council Member Zimmerman said, this is part of a series of forums. In forum number one, we really learned about demographics, how there's changes in the makeup of the United States, and there's also really shifting preferences in what kind of places people like to live and work and shop. And we talked about the impact that has on land use, on tax base, and how we plan cities. Forum number two, we talked about the benefits of employment options. We talked about what companies consider on where to locate. We talked about how office spaces are changing. And we had a really interesting discussion on how the city partners with employers and development developers to attract employment to Sugar Land. Forum number three, we talked about creating successful places like Town Square. We talked about what it takes to make those places, and we also talked about what it takes to create successful retail. Forum number four, we looked at a variety of different housing options, everything from large lot single family to multifamily, and talked about where different kinds of densities might be appropriate. Today, we want to talk about transportation. I want to start with a pretty startling graph. This is the history of how Americans have moved since World War II. What this is is vehicle miles traveled per capita, how many miles every one of us drives. 
And what you can see here is really clear. The interstate highway system back in the 1950s, and you can see this strong upwards curve that in 1960, we were driving 4,000 miles, and by 2000, we were driving 10,000 miles. This is the history of US transportation, and it is also the history of Sugarland. Sugarland was based, was, was grew up as a city around the idea of driving further. The idea that if you could drive further, you could find a better place to live, a better lifestyle, more options, more choices, better schools. And transportation planning in the United States has been based around this really rock solid diagonal curve. You look at recessions, maybe a tiny blip, but this has just kept going up and up and up. And then something really odd happened. This is what has happened for the last couple of years, and this started before the recession, and it has been continuing since the recession was over, and it has been seen across the United States, every state of the Union, we are seeing the amount that every person drives actually getting less for the first time since World War II. And at first, everybody thought it was a blip. At first, everybody thought it was just a temporary little thing. But now we're seeing it year after year. We're seeing that decline. And we're also seeing a lot of other stats that back that up. People aren't getting their driver's licenses at 16 anymore. People are actually waiting to get their driver's licenses, unprecedented. Um, and so there really seems to be a shift in attitude towards transportation. Now, let me put a couple of caveats on this. First of all, this is still a lot of driving. Nothing in here says people are no longer driving. Second of all, in a region that is growing, even if per capita VMT is going down, that doesn't mean total VMT is going down. As more people move here, you are still seeing traffic increase. In regions that aren't seeing that kind of population growth, and I just read a great article that in the Philadelphia area, the turnpike authorities are all running into problems since their tolls aren't going up. Their traffic is no longer increasing. They widened the roads for additional traffic. They issued bonds for that, and now they're not getting the toll revenue to pay off those bonds. We're really lucky to have an economy here. We're really lucky to be in a growing place. Um, and the other real caveat I'll put on this is this doesn't mean Americans are not driving. It means Americans are driving less. And what could that mean? One of those things could be living closer to work, simply choosing a shorter commute. And that has very big implications in people's preferences on where to live. And you can see it in Houston. If you see all those townhouses along Washington Avenue, that is people choosing to live closer to work. And they are decreasing how many miles they drive every day. It's also people choosing to live and work in walkable places with neighborhood services. Most of our trips over the week are not home to work. They're all the other trips we make. So if we are living closer to stores, if we are shopping closer to home, if we are going to restaurants closer to home, if we're choosing to walk to the park rather than drive to the park, all of those things are lowering VMT. It's people choosing to bike. Um, if you look at cities like Portland, the biggest increase in transportation modes is actually on the biking side. And it's people taking transit. That obviously, if you take a park and ride bus into downtown rather than driving the whole way, you are reducing the vehicle miles you're driving. So what I would point to here is that there's a pretty fundamental shift in transportation. And what we have looked at through these forums is what is changing. I can tell you what will stay the same. I can tell you that the vast majority of the trips in Sugar Lane will be made by single family vehicles for any future we can foresee right now. And we know what that network looks like. Sugar Lane's not in a position to build new arterials. Nobody is going to propose to bulldoze a path through your neighborhood to build a new roadway. But what this is suggesting is there's a demand for other options. And if you look at Sugar Lane's own plans, that is already an established part of city policy. Um, the Sugar Lane Comprehensive Mobility Plan, um, I helped work on that. Jeff Carlton, who will be speaking later, helped work on that. Um, defines a goal in terms of strategic mobility, in terms of superior mobility, and really looks at adding more modes to the system, and looks at optimizing the facilities we have. Because widening roadways isn't always a possibility. The question is, how can we make them more effective? Um, but 
One key thing in there is it recognizes the link to land use. The idea that land use and development patterns are a really important part of mobility. Because traffic, nobody drives in order to drive. Those people lined up at that triple left turn lane right there, they aren't there because they got out of work and said, I'd really like to drive somewhere. They're trying to get home. They're trying to get to the store. And so ultimately, those destinations are what drive transportation. And we can't talk about transportation without talking about land use. And the citizens of Sugar Land recognize that. In the survey done as part of the Comprehensive Mobility Plan, second to the top in terms of how important different measures were was coordinating land use with transportation. And that can be a factor in all of the different kinds of uh, land use projects Sugar Land's undertaking right now. The development of new activity centers, for example, is a really big part of transportation. Locating things next to each other so people don't have to drive to get lunch. That's part of the transportation picture. Um, so that's why we're focusing an entire forum on this. Because we don't think we can have a discussion about land use without talking about transportation. And we don't think we can have a t discussion about transportation without talking about land use. So what we're going to look at is how land use patterns affect mobility, what the benefits of a multimodal transportation system are, the impacts of regional compared to local mobility, long distance trips and short distance trips, and how other places that are like Sugar Land have included multiple transportation options in their planning. We are going to start here with Jeremy Nelson. He's a tr transportation planner who has worked across the country in a wide variety of places, um, really looking at land use and transportation together, at revitalization strategies, at suburban transit-oriented development, at integrating ped bike. And he's been part of a lot of award-winning projects from awards like institutions like the Congress for New Urbanism, American Planning Association, and Association of Environmental Professionals, Bachelor of Arts from Reed College, Master of Arts in Urban Planning from UCLA, and a Certificate of Sustainable Management from the Presidio Graduate School, where he's actually an expert in residence. So please introduce and welcome Jeremy Nelson. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? I was told the light there turns green once I press the button. Well, I really am honored to be here tonight. I don't know how many of y'all have been to some of the previous land use forums. I, um, in preparation, just finished watching all of the four previous forums uh, this afternoon. Um, it's quite an honor to be part of this series, and I think uh, you as residents and business owners in the city of Sugarland uh, have a lot to be proud of your city staff and leadership for putting this together. Um, I was joking the other day as we were taking a tour that I feel like I should have written a tuition check for the PhD uh, education I got watching the previous forums in urban planning. So I feel like uh, you all have a lot to be proud of, and I'd like to thank uh, city staff for accommodating me as an outsider and showing me around town. Um, I want to get a sense of, you heard a little bit about my background, I want to get a sense of who's in the room, and I, I'm based in Durango, Colorado, so I brought some chocolates from Durango. I'm going to pass out for occasional quest people who are brave enough to answer my occasional questions. Uh, and for those of you listening at home or online or the Twitter sphere, hurry down here and get chocolate before they, they run out. Um, so I'd like to know who's, who's here in the room? Uh, who's a resident of Sugarland? If you raise your hand up. Who's been a resident for more than three years? Keep your hands up. More than five years? More than 10 years? Keep your hands up, please. More than 15 years? 20 years? 25, 30, wait, some hands are going, okay, oh, you're, you're, you're just waiting to raise your hand, okay, you don't want to waste your time holding your hand up, okay, 35, okay, so somewhere between 30 and 35, 34, 33, okay, 
Bob, you get a chocolate. You're the longest resident in the room if we have our math right. Thank you. Uh, who's a business owner? You can be a resident and a business owner, but who's a business owner here tonight? Owns a business in Sugarland or no business owners, no merchants? They're all doing the books after closing or still working? Uh, property owner, a non-residential property owner, like a commercial property owner or a developer, maybe. Any developers want to raise their hand? Okay, so mostly, oh, oh, yes? Okay, for chocolate, for chocolate, yes. <laughs> You're a developer for jobs. All right. <laughs> Some projects that may be the only compensation, right? Okay. Well, that, thank you for playing along with me, and I'll have some questions throughout the presentation, and uh, also have more chocolate. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of who was here. Um, I spent, as I mentioned, I spent the last few days uh, walking and biking and being driven in a van safely by city staff uh, around your beautiful town. And uh, really impressed. I've uh, lived and worked on the West Coast in San Francisco Bay Area. Like I said, I'm currently in uh, a cutesy little tourist town in uh, Colorado. Um, so I've seen a lot of different uh, urban environments, built environments, small towns, big towns, and uh, really impressed with uh, Sugarland and the level of amenity and also the level of uh, clear uh, uh, care and concern you have and pride that you have in your community um, based on the built environment. I'm realizing I need to advance my slides as I talk instead of just my paper slides. Um, so here's briefly what I'm going to talk about and I need to make sure I don't go over. Jeff's going to uh, shoot me daggers if I get close to my 30 minutes so that we preserve time for him. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why should you care about transportation. Um, there are several good reasons. Many of them have nothing to do with transportation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why you need a smart mobility strategy, uh, five key principles to build one on. Many of them are already enshrined in your comp plan, so I'll be repeating. For those of you who memorized that document, a mobility plan, a comprehensive mobility plan, you'll be hearing those again. And then, uh, just in brief, with all of my expertise gleaned over the past 48 hours, to tell you what you should do in your community, uh, five changes or five uh, initiatives that I think, just with fresh eyes, could be undertaken uh, are fairly doable, uh, fairly small changes that could have big results in terms of uh, uh, increasing the sustainability uh, and efficiency of your transportation system for all modes and, and for all system users. So that's kind of what I was thinking we'd talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to jabber on for a while, but then I'm really hoping that we'll have a lot of time for questions, and I'm going to stay for the small group discussions. I want everybody to be putting on their transportation thinking hats like these gentlemen have done. Um, and I would say one other thing, I'm going to th throw a lot of charts at you. Uh, I saw the previous forums, there were lots of slides with beautiful pictures. Uh, I have less of those and more of chart after chart after chart, I'm kind of a data guy. Um, in fact, Christoph uh, showed a few of charts, uh, so you'll see those again, uh, similar charts I was going to show. Um, but I, I do want to be clear, some of these charts and, and graphics I borrowed from some of my colleagues or mentors, uh, firms I've worked at, I try to put the citations in, but for any of you who have been in my position giving a presentation like this before, if you don't see a citation, it's in the notes, I'm happy to show you or get you a copy of the presentation through the city staff. Just want to make sure everyone's clear that uh, some of these are borrowed. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, stealing from one is plagiarism, but borrowing from many is research. So keep that in mind as you see my slides. So five good reasons to care about transportation. Well, this is the main one, right? This is what most of us think about when we think about, let's fix the transportation problem. It's all those idiots that are in their cars driving, keeping me in my car from getting home on time, right? Um, I'm late because of all these other drivers. So that's an obvious one, an important one, um, something to consider when building your transportation system. I'd like to suggest there's a number of other reasons to really think about the principles on which you build your transportation system and how you invest uh, in your transportation system. Uh, this, a lot of you have probably seen this graphic before. This just shows uh, obesity rates among adults, uh, 1990, 2000, 2010. There's more recent data out, I understand. Uh, the darker the red, 
the higher the percentage of adults with a, a BMI body mass index that's considered unhealthy or obese, it, the blue, blue is good, red is bad, essentially. And you can see that over time, almost every state in the nation is on a downward trend. And of course, there's a number of factors that are contributing to this. I'm not going to say that transportation is the only one, how we get around. Uh, but certainly, the way we build our communities, there's some correlation to those, tr to those obesity trends. This shows the mode split, average mode split of, of various countries. Uh, walk, bike, and transit, non-auto mode split, excuse me, uh, relative to the national BC rates. So you can see a correlation, the higher your non-auto mode split, more people biking, walking, uh, taking transit, the lower your national BC rate. Um, again, I'm not saying that's a statistically significant uh, relationship, I'm saying there's a correlation there and that certainly the way we get around has some effect on those, on those obesity trends. Um, and then, of course, our transportation system affects our health in other ways, right? Uh, if you look at the teal bars, these are the 10 leading causes of potential years of lost life. So uh, accountants and insurance folks like to think about these actuarial tables and the potential risks of, uh, and, and value of years of lost life. Um, th these are the top 10 as of 2009. Uh, the teal bars are not transportation related, so there's a number that, uh, five or so of those that have nothing to do with transportation. But one could make the argument that half of the top 10 leading causes of lost years of life in our country have some bearing on the transportation system. Whether it's the red bar of actual being in a vehicle crash that results in lost years of life, uh, pollution exposure, uh, the yellow bars uh, from motor vehicles, uh, or a sedentary lifestyle, again, those, those obesity rates from, from being behind our car, you know, the wheels of our car uh, too much. So I'd like to argue that this is an important issue. This isn't just about you know, touchy-feely, let's all go out for a walk and, and let's all bike. These are significant issues um, with serious implications. And again, to show the relationship between uh, the way we get around, the way we build our communities and how we travel, and uh, these issues of uh, public health and public safety. This graph just shows traffic fatil fatal fatalities excuse me, per 100,000 residents. Uh, you can see that the quote unquote smart growth or more compact uh, communities or counties are in green at the top. They have the lower rates. Uh, the ones at the bottom have the, the most sprawled counties have the higher rates of uh, traffic fatalities. It's a clear pattern. Again, a correlation, a pattern. Um, and not so much, I guess, in this community, but in other communities I work in, uh, there's often a perception of, well, it's not safe uh, from, a, from a criminal, uh, from a, a risk of crime standpoint, it's not safe to walk or bike. Um, I don't really get that sense walking around Sugarland. I think the, the demographics are a little different here than um, maybe some communities where that is a concern, a legitimate concern. Um, but one of the graphs I like to show is that the actual risk of being a victim of a, of a personal crime, of a violent crime, whoops, sorry, I'm behind on my slides. Um, this, this graph is just showing the relative risk of being uh, killed in a uh, motor vehicle versus being killed as a result of a violent crime, homicide, aggravated assault, etc. cetera. Uh, the dash line is the uh, motor vehicle lethality rate, as epidemiologists call it. The solid line is the criminal uh, uh, risk of being killed as, part of, as a result of a violent criminal act. Uh, so you can see that these, both of those rates have been declining. But what's interesting to me, and that's for a number of reasons, but what's interesting to me is that they're actually almost identical, right? But if you watch the evening news or you talk to some of your family members, you might think, well, it's more dangerous to go walk and bike than it is to drive a car. When in fact, that's uh, excuse me, it's more, it's more dangerous to go out and walk a bike so you're going to be a victim of a crime than it is to, to, to drive. Um, but that's actually not the case. So sometimes our perceptions and the reality aren't always aligned. Uh, in fact, this graph shows... Are you bored with graphs yet? Should I bring some more chocolate out? Uh, this graph actually shows that there's safety in numbers. Right? So on the bottom axis, the, the mode to work or the journey to work uh, mode share. How many people are walking and biking in your community? 
on, on the uh, y-axis the relative risk index. So you can see the pattern. These, is, these dots each represent one community. Uh, so you can see that the more people that are walking and biking, the lower the risk of being in a, a collision or injury collision as a bicyclist or a pedestrian. So what happens is, uh, as if you double the, 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 the formula, is if you double walking or bicycling in your community, it increases the total injuries by 32%, about a third, right? But if you normalize that by the number of increased people walking and biking, so it's on a per person or per trip basis, it reduces your individual risk by 66%. So overall injuries, collisions go up, but the relative or per person risk goes down because there's more people walking, more people biking. There's safety in numbers when it comes to these modes. Here's another reason to care about, uh, about transportation, not necessarily transportation related. Uh, this is from California. If you see graphs uh, from California, it's because I worked in California and the West Coast for a good decade. Uh, so I tried to scrub some of the ones that are least relevant, but I still feel like even in Houston and in Texas, Houston area in Texas, I feel like uh, talking about energy is, is relevant. Um, although I did see on t a TV ad, uh, energy company uh, offering you either free energy at night, free electricity at night, or free electricity on the weekends. And I've never seen that before. I was thinking only in Texas do you give away energy. Um, but no, no boom like that can last forever, right? So. And even if, uh, even if there is a, a, not a concern about the current price of energy or, or supply, uh, one argument that some uh, uh, countries have made who are oil rich is they want to be as conservative as possible and efficient as possible with their energy usage so that as supplies dwindle, they can sell as much as possible to other places and reap the income from that. So by essentially eating less of your seed corn, as they say in Kansas where I grew up, uh, you are able to sustain the revenue off of that resource for as long as possible. Bottom line, this just shows that uh, we think of uh, you know, energy, energy usage of buildings as being a significant factor. Uh, this graph is a, a study of California uh, office buildings and essentially showing that the commute, driving a car to and from, all the people driving to and from that office building actually expends more energy in terms of BTUs, British thermal units, then operating the building itself, the air conditioning, the heating, etc. cetera. Uh, and so some people say, well, sure, we knew that, but uh, green buildings, that's the answer, green buildings. For those of you interested in this somewhat esoteric topic, The Very Hungry City by Austin Troy, great book. Uh, he makes the argu argument, uh, or backs up with more data, the argument that the energy consumption going to and from a building is actually higher than the energy consumption uh, 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 generated by the building, uh, the operation of the building. Uh, and he's, he actually shows that on average, lead buildings, green buildings, use more energy than non-lead buildings. And there's a number of reasons for that, which I won't go into. Um, there's a way, though, to make your development, the, the energy and the traffic caused by your development, to reduce that, uh, what we call low traffic development, right? Uh, here's conventional development pattern, make sure these animations are working. Single uses separating by, separated by large parking lots, fronting the street. Each, accessing each use requires an auto trip. Even if it's close enough to walk, you wouldn't really want to do it. So that's multiple auto trips for each use, multiple parking spaces. So that's the conventional development pattern. We're all familiar with that. I think you have uh, examples of that here in Sugarland. Of course, right outside our window, we have an example of this is the number of trips, P is parking, T is trips. We have an example of a mixed use park once district, right? Where a tighter street grid, uses are clustered, parking is uh, shared and, and off, off the street. So a park once district, you can park your car and then walk for the remainder of your trips to various uses. So I'm clicking through my animations, there we go. Uh, so that's not meant to be a vision test. But what are, the, what are the results of that? I'll read them to you. Uh, this is rule of thumb, half the parking. A mixed use park once district relative to conventional development, single use spread out by parking lots. Half the parking, approximately half the land area, a quarter of the arterial trips, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and, and importantly, one sixth of the turning movements, right? And I think as most traffic engineers will tell you, 
the way I was told, uh, it's the turning movements on and off of the arterial that actually uh, cause the turbulence, a lot of the turbulence that uh, slows down traffic flow and throughput. So it would, by having one turn in and one turn out in a Park Once district, you can actually still serve the same number of uses, uh, provide that access, uh, but with far fewer vehicle trips on and off and far fewer, less, much less traffic on and off the arterial. Uh, this is just transitory development with the addition of bus rapid transit or train. Uh, you can arguably have the same level of access with no vehicle trip in those districts. I'm going to skip through a few of these um, just to make sure we have time at the end. But um, there's also, you know, so I've touched on a few of the you know, kind of uh, touchy-feely uh, energy efficiency and uh, uh, obesity rates and public health, uh, all of those things. I would make the argument there's a very uh, hard-nosed, fiscal conservative, system efficiency argument you can make for uh, having, uh, for caring about tra a sustainable transportation system. This just shows research that says the closer you live to transportation choices, uh, the more likely, uh, or the less VMT of your household. So on the bottom uh, axis is the distance for urban and suburban. This is not just urban areas, this is in suburban locations. The distance you live from either transit or a bike facility or a uh, uh, dense uh, sidewalk network and your household's VMT. And some people argue, well, uh, people are self-selecting. Those people who are more inclined to walk, bike, and take transit are moving to those areas, and then they're driving less because they can. It's not that the area made them drive less. And my response to that is, so what? So we've given people a choice that want to drive less to do so. So whether what the cause and effect is, I don't care. But it just means that's one less vehicle in front of me when I'm driving, and it's more people walking and biking when I'm making those choices. Uh, as a developer in the room, another reason it's important to right-size your transportation system, we'll talk a little bit later about removing barriers to development. Uh, you know, if you're building a transportation, if you're building the church parking lot for Easter Sunday, uh, it may seem like a good idea from a policy perspective just to be sure and make sure no one calls and complains about parking problems. But from a development standpoint, it actually can be a significant barrier to making your project pencil. And so you want to make sure we're right-sizing the transportation system, being efficient. Here's another graph or illustration that just shows the spatial efficiency of different modes, right? If you're trying to stretch the utility of your infrastructure, uh, I understand there's a plan uh, on, uh, to widen, potentially widen uh, Highway 6 a little bit more. Uh, that's one way to add to accommodate more vehicle trips. Another way is to uh, improve the efficiency of your existing right-of-way through mode shift. And of course, uh, we, some, sometimes I hear when I talk to people, well, uh, driving alone to work, that's the American way. This is a poster from World War II. Actually, carpooling is patriotic. Uh, it's a, the, original, the original conception of carpooling was uh, gas supply or gas shortages during World War II. Let's beat fascism by carpooling. So if we can beat fascism by carpooling, we certainly can beat traffic by carpooling. In fact, if you think about it, the single best way to increase the efficiency of your vehicle transportation system is to fill all those empty seats in the average car during the morning commute, right? I mean, if you look at the people left and right of you on the freeway, two people maybe, rarely three, all those empty seats represent unused capacity. So for those engineers uh, here or, or watching, <coughs> That's a system efficiency approach. So I was just going to show gas prices and that Houston gas prices fairly well track with, with national gas prices, but I think everybody knows that, so I'll skip that. Another hard-nosed uh, fiscal responsibility uh, attack on why you should care about transportation is that low-density, sprawling development doesn't pay for its own life cycle infrastructure costs. You've already heard this if you've been to recent forums. Uh, uh, Charles Mar Marone, Marone. Uh, if you haven't read this book, I really encourage you to get it. You can get it off his website, uh, strongtowns.org or Amazon. Basically, if it's not paying for itself, somebody else is paying for it. Either you're getting external grants, regional, state, federal grants to pay for that infrastructure, at least for its first life cycle, 
or the rest of your town is subsidizing that over the course of various life cycles. Uh, so from a, a sustainability standpoint, thinking long-term sustainability, financial sustainability, low, sp low density sprawl does not pay for its own infrastructure. And then of course the free market, we're Americans, we're capitalists, right? We believe in the free market, we believe in consumer choice. Uh, this is another great book, Zoned Out, by Jonathan Levine. Uh, again, a book that I think if you're a planner or a planner geek like myself, uh, can change your life. He essentially argues that since World War II, most zoning codes have made walkable neighborhoods illegal. Think about site planning standards, think about street design standards. It's made walkability illegal in most communities. Uh, not here in Sugarland, I know, but in most communities. So he argues walkable neighborhoods are undersupplied from just a pure demand and supply perspective. Uh, so the data he presents is that housing consumers will pay a premium for walkable neighborhoods. And of course, you could, uh, you could uh, often hear the argument that, well, if we add more housing, more density, we're going to get more traffic, right? More housing units, multifamily, density, that's going to be traffic Armageddon. This graph is just meant to show that uh, annual VMT per household actually decreases as density increases. And this is for the San Francisco, LA, and Chicago metropolitan area. This is not just these big urban centers. This is the metropolitan area as a whole. And what's interesting to me on this graph is that the sweet spot is not out of the tail at 200 units per acre. The sweet spot in terms of the biggest drop in VMT is on the lower end of the spectrum. And I'll skip this graph because Christoph already presented it, but essentially uh, VMT is dropping on a normalized basis per capita, uh, population adjusted. VMT is dropping. This, this has never happened before. And it's, you'll note it's also not just a recession uh, issue. Uh, you can see the gray bar, the last gray bar is the most recent, the Great Recession. Uh, and VMT continued to drop uh, after the recession was over. Uh, and I think that's for a number of reasons. One is teen, teen uh, drivers' licensing rates is going down. If you look at the left-hand side of this graph, the teenagers, over the past 30 years, the licensing rates have dropped. Chocolate time. How many of you remember when you got your driver's license? Okay. I'm just going to randomly distribute, since there's no right answer here. <laughs> Who else remembers? This side of the room's feeling cheated. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, right back, way in the back. Okay, got it. <laughs> Good catch. So let me just say, your kids and grandkids, if they're teenagers, this major milestone that you remember the day you got your license, freedom, independence from my parents, I can go meet uh, the opposite sex somewhere or hang out with friends. Uh, a large major, a large significant portion of teenagers today will not ever remember that milestone. In fact, they'll probably more, they're more likely to remember when they got their first smartphone so they can start texting their friends and being on Facebook. So, I mean, getting your license and having a car, that was access, right? Access to friends, independence. The smartphone is that access to friends and independence now. Uh, so that's one of the reasons VMT is going down, I think. Another reason is the aging of the baby boomers, right? So that's, you get chocolate for that as well. Uh, these are just demographic, demographers put together age pyramids. Uh, you can see that the top part of the, the pyramid is getting fatter. That means more people who are 55 and better. Uh, as a friend of mine who works in senior services says, we're all seniors or future seniors. So this is happening. This is already happening. The, the baby boomers are starting to retire. Obviously, they're driving less, less VMT. So those are, I thought I said five, but I think many more than five. Um, those are several good reasons to care about transportation uh, and for your community to think about what a smart mobility strategy really means. Um, I read through uh, your comp plan. Uh, it's very good. Com uh, your mobility plan is part of your comp plan. Uh, my experience reading general plans, as they're called in California, or comp plans in other places, is you have a list of uh, policy goals and objectives that look something like this. Promote affordable housing, add appro appropriate density, 
uh, create ped friendly streets. I don't know what ped friendly actually means, but um, you know, good stuff, reduce vehicle trips, honor motherhood, enjoy apple pie. No one objects to that. But in practice, many communities are still building streets like this. What do we do when a, when a project comes in the door uh, that has a, you know, too much, generates too many trips according to the black box model, or uh, we perceive has a parking problem? Uh, we reduce the development density, we widen the road, we add more parking, or we move the project to a cow field where all of those problems go away for at least 10 or 15 years until the development catches up with the cow field development. So, you know, there's an example of a mitigation, an improvement. Um, you saw a lot of these kind of projects as part of the stimulus uh, because they were shovel ready. Um, my interpretation of a lot of the shovel ready projects was future stupid. Uh, because they were not, they, they put people to work and did nothing else um, in terms of long term. So it's, it, my point is that in our, in our policies, we say we want these lofty things, uh, walkability, bikeability, and in practice, we build something completely different. We say we want this, we want vibrant streets, walkability, we want kids to be able to bike to school or bike to the park after school. Here's a bunch of young toughs on their bikes after school or summer vacation. We want families to be able to walk and visit their neighbors like we did when we were growing up. We want to be able, as we get older, to, to age in place, to not have to leave our neighborhood because we can't drive anymore. We want to be able to walk to the corner store. Uh, so that's what we say we want, but then we build stuff like this, or we allow it to be built. We build office parks like this. We build transit stops on the left, like that. That's the technical term for that is a pole in the hole. Uh, a very high level amenity to honor our transit, our transit passengers who are helping us solve our regional traffic problem. Um, standing there in the gravel next to the, the road. Uh, we allow sidewalks to be built discontinuous. I would, I would argue, you know, people see this photo and they say, well, the sidewalk looks like that because that property hasn't redeveloped and, and sidewalks are the responsibility of the property owner. As soon as that redevelops, well, well then we'll, we'll connect that gap. We'll require the developer to do that. And my argument is, if this picture looked different and the sidewalk continued, but the street just turned into a, a muddy gravel road, and no one would make that argument that, well, we, we just haven't built the street, we haven't closed that gap in the street network because we, we're waiting for a developer to do that. So I would argue that this is uh, sort of a sign of an uneven, uh, unbalanced transportation system. We build streets like this. I'm told there's a pedestrian there in the center. So what I'm, what I'm getting at, and I'm pulling some you know, sort of extreme examples to make the point, uh, but what I'm getting at is that I think we send a mixed message. You know, we, we have our policies about walkability and bikeability, and, and then we have what we actually build on the ground or, or allow to remain, and I think we're sending a decidedly mixed message, which is, are we, are we really serious about walkability? I mean, um, I can talk a little bit about more later, but uh, I'm staying over at Lake Point, and I've been over to City Hall a couple times. Two great walkable areas in their own way, their own character, but you take your life into your own hands to walk or bike between them, right? And I've done it twice. Um, foolhardy, I guess. So those are the reasons to care and the disconnect between policy and practice. I'm going to go through these principles of a of a mobility strategy quite quickly. How are we on time? I've lost track of time. Less than five minutes. Less than five minutes, okay. Um, I'll go through them very quickly. Here are five strategies, or five principles I think you need to build a mobility strategy on if it's gonna be smart and sustainable. And they're gonna go by quick. Trust me, they're all right. And if you have questions, we can talk about them later. <laughs> Access equals value creation. Sometimes we talk about transportation as if it were means to an end. Actually, I would argue that transportation creates economic value to uh, parcels. Uh, it creates economic uh, development potential. And if we think about transportation investments as what will create the most value long term, not just solve intersection level of service seconds of delay in the five year uh, timeline, I think we'll make different decisions and different investment uh, priorities. Same, uh, another principle, oops, there we go. Another principle is congestion equals economic activity. No one likes being stuck in traffic. Sometimes traffic is an accident. 
or a special event. But think about places that have no traffic congestion. It's the same with parking. There's never a hard time finding a parking space because no one wants to go there. So next time you're stuck in traffic, think of it as a good problem to have, better than the alternative. Emphasizing access and emphasizing placemaking equals long-term success. It's proven time and time again. Previous speakers have showed you examples of that. Emphasizing mobility and ever-expanding auto capacity is a recipe for long-term failure. That's my position. I'm happy to debate it later. I think there's examples of it uh, throughout, the, throughout the Houston region, uh, but also throughout the country, that um, that's a dead-end strategy. Um, and a, and a, a highly costly strategy to pursue in terms of where you put, put your energy and your money. Um, I mentioned level of service earlier. Level of service is a, a performance measure that transportation engineers and planners use to um, assess the success of a street. Auto level of service, how many seconds of delay through an intersection typically uh, for the typical motorist. Uh, so I want, I've got two chocolates left. Uh, I want everyone to imagine your favorite street growing up. You can close your eyes if you want to make it more sacred. Uh, imagine your favorite street when you were growing up. Might be the street your house was on or the street outside a park or just think about that street. Everyone have a street in mind? It might be a street in currently in, outside your house today. Uh, but imagine your favorite street. Now I'd like uh, someone to tell me what the level of service, auto level of service was on that street. No one knows. What, did someone actually know? You know, it's an A. Okay, great, chocolate. How many seconds of delay at the typical intersection eh, on your favorite street? Less than 10. Less than 10. But you're guessing to get chocolate, I think. No, no cars. Yes, you want the chocolate. Um, my point is, obviously, is that you don't care. Your memories of that street, of what made it a great place, have very little to do with level of service. But when streets are being designed by us professionals, level, auto level of service, intersection sec uh, seconds of delay, is like the most important thing we care about, right? Mismatch. It has nothing to do with what we remember about a, uh, our favorite streets. And then finally, uh, managing demand for travel, uh, which formerly used to be kind of a, a hippie communist thing that we did in response to the oil crisis in the 70s and Carter got kicked out of office for it and those kinds of things. Uh, I would actually argue managing demand is, from an economist's perspective and an engineer's perspective, a fiscally conservative approach versus adding new capacity for uh, ever more auto trips when you think about the life cycle costs. And then finally, it sounds easy to, when we present slides like this and we talk about it, but transportation like life involves trade-offs. There's no silver bullet. It's more like silver buckshot. Try a lot of things and some of them work, and in the cumulative effect uh, hopefully helps you balance the tensions and trade-offs in a st strategic way. Um, I think with that, I will go through five changes quickly, and then I'm done. Uh, the five changes based on, again, my 48 hours on the ground here in Sugarland that I think are doable and would have a, a big bang for the buck uh, are are not always uh, necessarily, uh, or some of them may be counterintuitive at first, but I think they're worth uh, considering and discussing. Um, I would argue that they don't have to magic dramatically reduce traffic congestion. Uh, traffic congestion is nonlinear, as this graph is intended to show. A, a small decrease in the number of vehicles at peak hour times can result in a, in a disproportionate increase or improvement in travel times. Um, a, dis a disproportionate uh, decrease in, in travel times, excuse me. Uh, and then if you build it, they will come. The field of dreams cliche is actually true when it comes to bike and ped. A lot of studies show this is Portland. Red bars are the number of miles of bikeways in Portland, Oregon over a 30 year, 20 year time frame. The white line is the number of bicyclists increasing during that time. So as they built more bike lanes, guess what? People felt safer biking and they biked more and more people started biking who wouldn't have considered it before. Uh, so here are the five changes. I think Sugarland needs to commit in a serious way to bike and ped connectivity. We talked about Lake Point and Town Center being walkable pods that are disconnected from each other. Uh, this graph is meant to show the, how far you can, a one mile walk in a grid on the left versus a one, the destinations you can access in a one mile walk in a more cul-de-sac 
loops and lollipop street pattern on the right. Um, I think that Sugarland has examples of both. Some are more successful than others. And figuring out how to connect the areas of town that are walkable with walkable links, bikeable links. Everybody's heard of walkscore.com. A, uh, a lot of retailers actually are promoting the walk score of houses now in many urban markets. Uh, I just Google or I just punched in Sugarland. Uh, the green or yellow, I guess, is good. Red is unwalkable, according to WalkScore. Um, this is based on number of destinations you can actually walk to from a particular point. Uh, so you can see, again, certain areas moderately walkable, not all of them connected. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Great, a bike lane. The bike lane ends. Now what do I do? In the lower right-hand corner. I merge into traffic, but there's no guidance on how I do that. Um, and so this is an example from our, our driving tour. Uh, so think about connectivity in a serious way. Rethink your street design standards. I know that's an ongoing process, having talked with staff. Uh, that's something that's ongoing. Uh, the two biggest changes I recommend are uh, uh, skinny and slow streets save lives. So this graph is just showing uh, the faster the speed of the vehicle, when it collides with you, the more likely you'll be injured or die. Makes sense. So what's the response? Slow down your speed limits. Do that through... Uh, posted speed limits, but also do that through design. Narrower streets equal slower speeds. This graph shows that skinny streets save lives. The narrower the curb-to-curb -curb dimension, the less injury accidents per mile per year. This is an example from Irving, Texas. That's a state highway. Their main bullet, their sort of downtown main boulevard. It's a project I worked on to redesign that, that they're moving forward, trying to move forward with implementation on, going from four to five lanes down to two. Bike, a protected bike lane, wider sidewalks. And then reprioritize your investments to reduce peak traffic rather than simply accommodate it. So managing travel demand, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, I would say for Sugarland, and I know this is part of your comp mobility plan and your bike ped plan, a Safe Routes to School program on average, 30% of morning vehicle trips are school-related trips. And when I see uh, surplus bike capacity, this was after school let out, so uh, one at, at one of the local schools, lots of uh, surplus bike parking. Some people are biking already. But you see the queue that stretches around the block of moms and dads parked waiting to pick up their kids. Um, Safe Routes to School program, a very robust one in coordination with the school district, could help reduce your peak hour, morning peak hour vehicle trips. And then removing uh, barriers to quality infill development. I think the two best ways maybe for Sugarland to do that is think about uh, parking requirements, whether to reduce or remove them or make uh, encourage shared parking like is done in town center. Um, that's one of the biggest barriers to infill development. And also live work units as part of your thinking about uh, product types and land use uh, where you put different uh, types of residential. If you think about a live work unit where you can uh, li work in the same place in the same building or at least the same, uh, even sometimes the same unit where you live, that's a zero commute workplace, right? Um, and in fact, it reflects what some people call the, the freelance economy or the naked economy in which we're less about uh, less employees of larger corporations and more people working for themselves. It's a very entrepreneurial economy that's emerging. Um, this is just some examples from Walnut Creek who rethought, in Walnut Creek, California, they rethought their parking standards. And um, the last thing I'll say is I think uh, Sugarland could embrace innovation and change in terms of uh, pilot projects and uh, to not be afraid of incremental implementation. So what's called often lean urbanism or tactical urbanism. Um, I know if there are traffic engineers in the room, uh, that makes us nervous. Uh, there are processes to go through that, uh, to implement those kind of changes on an incremental or pilot basis. Uh, this is an example from a Minneapolis, uh, a $600 bike lane. Uh, again, the engineers in the room, I know people putting down tape on the street and plants makes us all kind of nervous, but uh, they closed the street to try this out. $600, community-based project with city support, and it's a way to test out new ideas that we haven't maybe done in Sugarland in the past, but that other communities have been successful with, and we don't have to go from 
nothing to gold-plated, we can sort of work our way up towards innovation and change. That's all I know. I hope I didn't go too far over. Thanks for your time and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I think I have one piece of chocolate left, so raise your hand if you need chocolate. Okay, here you go. Nice catch. Thank you. So our second speaker is Jeff Carlton. As I mentioned, he's actually worked on a lot of projects in Fort Sugar Land and Fort Bend, including the Comprehensive Mobility Plan and the Subregional Mobility Plan. Um, uh, at Traffic Engineers, Inc., which is a traffic engineering firm, actually one of the oldest in Texas, um, actually headquartered just up the freeway, just up the Southwest Freeway in Houston. So, Jeff Carl. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I come bearing graphs, but not chocolate, so I apologize. Uh, and, and again, I'll echo uh, some of the thoughts earlier. This is a really an amazing thing that the city is putting on, and I feel really honored to be able to be a part of it, to really engage in the types of conversations that you have, to make decisions and, and uh, about the future of the city. And what I hope to do today, having spent some time working in the city, is to share, uh, and, and some of what you'll see you'll have seen uh, maybe, maybe three times tonight, uh, but that it also try to ground it in some of what's really going on uh, in Sugar Land. So my bad pun of the title of this is the intersection of land use and mobility. Uh, but what I will say, make sure this is on, is that land use and mobility, we talked about it, uh, Christoph mentioned it in the, uh, that when we did the Sugar Land mobility plan, um, we, we really emphasize that, th that you know, one of the key things of a great mobility plan is a great land use plan. Uh, but land use and mobility in Sugar Land have been linked since before the city was even incorporated. From the, the founding of the city along the Brazos River as a key uh, transportation link to the growth of the railroads, which made this sort of the company town that it was, to the expansion of freeways like US 59, which coincided with the development of some of the first uh, you know, master plan communities for which Sugarland has always been known for. Some of the premier places to live uh, in, in the Houston region have all been driven by major mobility projects and, and they uh, intersect and are impossible to separate. And you can see here, you know, the Imperial Sugar uh, plant right on the railroad line, which was really the foundation of, of the original development in this area. Now, it may be a little hard to see, but as recently as 1995, Sugar Land was almost entirely a residential community. And that's not really that long ago. Um, and, and you can see here, it's, it's mostly the types of developments that are those master plan communities that tend to be uh, a few arterials, lots of local streets, sort of the, the, the cul-de-sac neighborhoods, as people call them, but very attractive and lots of people uh, sort of saw the demand in them. Over the last 20 years, a lot has changed. And a lot of that has to do with different types of land use that have been incorporated. You can see from here to here, what you see really is the change is largely uh, around new job centers, new retail centers, places like Town Center, Sugar Land Business Park. And that's fundamentally changed the city, but still working on the same basic uh, uh, mobility uh, sort of uh, backbone that has always been in place with, with some advances. Uh, and what that really has done, and I think this is uh, pretty amazing, is in 1990, the average sales tax uh, per resident of Houston was 63, or of Sugar Land, I'm sorry, was $63. Over the last 20 years, with all that development, uh, that has gone from to $478. And that is a huge increase that has allowed the city to continually try and reinvest itself uh, and, and do things like Town Center, like the new ballpark, like the... Um, uh, the uh, entertainment center that, that's proposed. And, and so that, all that new development uh, but has been done still, in, and I'll show you've seen this before, in a way that is in sort of the post-war uh, suburban development pattern that makes Sugar Land a very car-dependent city. There are pockets like where we are today uh, that are walkable, but it still is largely a car-dependent car city. So what I'd like you to think about uh, as I'm talking, as you think about planning, as you think forward, is think systems. And Jeremy showed some really great examples of 
uh, different types of systems. When he showed uh, you know, the roadway system and how it is, it's connected, uh, how drivers use it, how pedestrians use it, how cyclists use it, how the sidewalks operate. One uh, break in that system, uh, because we're thinking about a single point, uh, means that the whole overall system is weaker. Uh, think about transit systems, think about parking systems, and all these things need to work together. And as the city has this conversation, it's really about the value decisions that the, the, the residents and the business leaders of the city make on what the types of outcomes that you get. One of my favorite quotes about systems is, every system is perfectly designed to deliver the outcomes that it is delivering. So what you have in place is perfectly designed to deliver the outcomes that you're getting. But thinking forward, is it designed to continue to uh, sort of deliver those outcomes that you want? And land use and development patterns are a critical part of that. So when we did the uh, Sugarland, um, the, mobi the mobility study, we asked people, what is, it, what is it that you really want? And how do you feel about the mobility uh, uh, outcomes for the city? And you know, one of the key things that when we ask people is, is mobility critical to the long-term success of, of the city? And overwhelmingly, absolutely yes. This is one of the key components, and I'll talk a little bit about how that factors in in a little bit. Uh, but one of the questions we, we asked is, is about choices, about better transportation options. And, and pretty overwhelmingly, people said, you know, we're happy with the roadway system, uh, but what we really want is more choices. I want to be able to not have to drive my car on the weekends, or I want to be able to take transit to my job, or I want to be able to walk and bike safely with my family. Now, one of the trade-offs of that is we also asked, are you willing to pay more uh, for better mobility? And the answer was, not really. Uh, and so that's sort of a tension that the city will have to deal with as it, as it goes forward of how do we um, actually use the resources that we have to better deliver the outcomes that we want. And I think Jeremy talked about some of those outcomes of can you use the resources you have, get similar outcomes from a roadway uh, uh, operation standpoint, but also deliver more value across more dimensions. Um, that we asked, does, it act, does the system create a good balance between roadway and other choices? Uh, clearly the answer was no, uh, with only 15% of people agreeing that that was the case. And then, you know, is, would more mixed use development be, be beneficial? And this was another answer where we weren't sure what people would say, but I think the example of town center and one of the things of having an example that people can look at really resonated with people to have, um, to have more places like this. So I want to talk a little bit about why land use matters and how people make transportation decisions. I'm going to talk about sort of five factors. One, travel time, convenience, reliability, cost, and safety and environment. Uh, Jeremy touched on some of these, but I'll, 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 I'll touch on them uh, again, maybe slightly differently. But land use has a key uh, impact on almost all of these. So travel time. This is a famous chart. So you'll see this in a lot of presentations that have to do with, with land use and mobility. But the way I like to talk about this is when you're making your transportation choice, think about how much time it takes you to get to a wide variety of destinations. Can I walk there? Can I bike there? Can I, do I have to drive there? Where can I get in sort of a 15 minute time frame? And on the left is what that looks like if I'm walking and I want to go one mile. On the right, in a sort of tight grid uh, neighborhood. On the right, obviously, is a more disconnected uh, roadway network. Same is true, though, for other modes, not just walking. And so one of, the, one of the things that you can look at is, I know it's going to advance like four slides as soon as it decides to advance. Ah, oh, perfect. That's actually easier. So where can I be in 15 minutes? One, this is a, a question that you can ask when you think about what type of transportation choices people are making. And you can see, the upper left here is all the places, this is a neighborhood in Houston, in the sort of older part of Houston that tends to be more of that tight grid. In a car, I can get to many, many places uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, in a bike, I can get to actually quite a few places. And I think this is one of the reasons that we're seeing a real growth in cycling is the uh, amount of places that I can get to in that bubble. If I can get to a grocery store, to the school, to you know, a, a restaurant, all within that sort of distance, that to me says that that place is a bikeable place. And so you're seeing a real growth because there's lots of places you can get to in that area. 
transit is slightly smaller, and that's something that, that the city of Houston is actually working on. A lot of this is driven on how, much, how long do I have to wait for the vehicle to show up. Once I'm actually on it, I can get lots of places, but that wait time eats into a big chunk of that 15 minutes. And then walking. And that's a, you know, it's a relatively small space, and you can see it has that sort of diamond shape that I showed you on the previous grid. But if there's lots of places within that area, that means that's a walkable place. And then this is here, this is Sugarland, basically right where we're standing. Again, you can see uh, in a car, I can get lots of places, particularly along the freeways, uh, and I can, I can connect to all of the places in and around town center. Uh, and on bike, and the effort that, that Sugarland's made in improving its bike, uh, bike planning, you can see that there are lots of destinations in that relatively uh, uh, a larger area. Transit, obviously there isn't anywhere you can get on transit. You can get on a park and ride, but in 15 minutes you're just going to be somewhere up the highway. Uh, and then walking, you can get in and around a town center, but it's actually hard to do things like get across the freeway because there aren't that many choices. It starts to look more like that picture on the right uh, that I showed earlier. So that's one way, travel time. How many places can I get and what that influences my mode choice. Another thing is convenience. So. When we talk about land use, sort of the, one part of it is form. And what, I, what this picture shows here is actually two identical land uses. They're both Walmart neighborhood centers. And one, Walmart's you know, trying to roll out sort of more tailored uh, uh, development to different neighborhoods. The land use on the left is incredibly convenient if I'm driving. I can pull up into a large parking lot, walk, uh, get, go to the front, um, and, and come out with my groceries. On the one on the right is is much more convenient if I'm walking. I don't have to walk across that large parking lot. It's more connected to other developments. So form and thinking about form, and I know you, the city is, is discussing sort of development codes, form really matters as well as land use as you're, as you're thinking about uh, convenience and, and travel. Uh, parking, talked a lot about parking. Sort of the concept of free parking. One of the things that's amazing, I looked at town center and I tried to figure out the amount of land area in town center that is devoted to parking, and it's about 45%. And so if you think that is not really sort of a driver of significant economic value in and of itself, obviously it's allowing people to get to the places in town center, but it's a fairly low value use in and of itself. It's also very expensive to uh, construct from a development standpoint and doesn't necessarily allow developers, developers to have other uses. And although it mostly is free, a lot of that cost ultimately gets passed on uh, in things like rents and, and prices to consumers. Uh, and then reliability is another thing that matters. One of the things that we look a lot at when I'm working on transit plans is reliability. People need to know that they can get where they want to go. Uh, and one way I explain to reliabil reliability to, to people is, on the right, if you were from Sugarland to go to the West Belfort Park and Ride, take a bus in the dedicated uh, uh, bus lanes downtown, you can be there in, uh, in about 45 minutes. And the reliability of that 45 minutes is very high because it has this dedicated lane um, and, and it can, it can uh, get in and out of, of the city relatively easily. Whereas on the right, when you're driving, some days it could take you 30 minutes and some days it could take you an hour. So then on average, you're both taking 45 minutes, but which one would you prefer something that you can depend on and know that you can set your schedule around or something that some days you're flying home like today when HISD is out of session and you get here, I got to Sugarland really fast. Uh, but other days it's going to take me an hour, add a lot of stress to my life and I'm less productive during that time. So thinking about reliability in the system is also important as well as levels of service. Uh, costs. Uh, you know, Sugarland is a relatively affluent community, and it, it, this hasn't been as, as big of an issue. But in a lot of communities, transportation uh, is an incredibly large amount of household budget. Uh, the AAA just came out with a their 2013 assessment of how much it costs to operate a vehicle. It's $9,000 a year on average to operate a, a typical car, $11,000 if you have an SUV, which is a huge chunk of... of uh, of a, of a household budget, particularly for people who are earning sort of the regional average of mid-50,000. So on the left is a graph. The areas in, in uh, yellow are places that you can afford a house at $50,000 with, with a payment that's 30% or less of your household income. And that's sort of the standard of kind of affordability. On the right 
is if you combine household income or uh, household costs and transportation costs in this standard, they said there's about 45%. The areas in yellow are the places that you can afford. It gets much smaller, and a lot of that is driven by the amount of uh, uh, how, how much it costs, what kind of transportation options you have. Uh, and this affects a lot of people in the types of choices they make and the types of choices they'll make in the future. Uh, safety. One of the things we ask residents of, of Houston, or uh, I'm sorry, of Sugarland is, you know, where do I feel safe? Majority of people, 75% said, I feel very safe driving in Sugarland. Uh, a little less than half said, I feel safe walking in Sugarland. And only about 15%, 16% said, I feel safe biking in Sugarland. And so that's something that try to, you know, to the point of getting more people out, uh, creating safer facilities, really emphasizing that as uh, to, get, to, to start to help people make different choices that they are saying that they would like to be able to do. Uh, again, this is a great chart. I mean, I think every transportation professional loves this chart uh, because it's so interesting. Like, this is total miles driven, and this is actually the aggregate of population growth and VMT. And you can see it's really sort, sort of flattened out, and we're at the, about the same place we were in 2004. Uh, and that's really, again, driven by miles per person uh, has gone down while population has gone up. What I think is really interesting is, you know, what happens next? Uh, most of our transportation planning is based on that dotted line, or maybe even the blue line that says, this is still an anomaly. We're going to start growing 2% a year. People are going to start driving more. We need to have the capacity to handle this in the future. Um, but what if it's the red line? What if it's the green line, that this is an actual fundamental shift? And there's reasons to believe that any one of those outcomes is, is entirely possible. And they were putting significant amount of funding into these, these this infrastructure investments. And we want to make sure that we're ultimately going to be able to, you know, sort of be able to be fiscally uh, supported. And we really need to understand what's happening because of demographics. This is sort of that chart broken into different age groups. And you can see the white line is the young, young uh, folks, 16 to 19. They've had a huge decline in VMT over the last sort of uh, 20 years, really. Uh, same with the 20 to 34. Those are going to be the people that are moving into sort of uh, uh, professional life, family life. There's a big question of where, whether those, change, those decisions will start to change as they have uh, kids and, and, and potentially make different decisions. Although some of the early uh, research is saying that there's a significant number of, of people in those groups are still maintaining the sort of low car lifestyle. So that's, this is incredibly important in thinking about these things. Um, so again, I, I'm just, what, one of the things I want to present is how uh, all these things have the potential to impact Sugarland. You know, this is really a decision for the community to make on what, what, the right, what the values are that you have. And I just think this is a great chart um, that shows, you know, in the 1800s, we built very straight paths for, uh, uh, for cows and people. And by 1950 to the present, we're building very straight paths for cars. And the paths we built for pedestrians, bikes, and transit are far more difficult and more windy. And it just sort of shows how the priorities have changed over time. So another thing, you know, the development patterns that we choose, they impact roadway capacity. So these are two charts. The one on the left and the one on the right have the exact same number of vehicle miles. Uh, but the one on the left has a much higher capacity to carry vehicles. And uh, I'll show you, you know, that, that has some, some real impacts on, uh, on the types of development choices that, that you make. One of the things is because Houston has a fairly high percentage of the types of development on the right. I, I found this just amazing. The Houston region, this includes Sugarland, the Houston urbanized region, has by far the most lane miles of any of the top 25 largest urbanized regions in the, in the United States. The only one close to us is St. Louis. And the reason St. Louis is close to us is they lost a lot of people. They built infrastructure and then people left, so the ratio really changed. So Houston, we have a significant built infrastructure of roadways. Uh, and how does that translate into congestion? Or are we, you know, you would think that we'd be really uh, doing great in terms of having very low congestion. But we're actually right in the middle of the pack. Um, so we've taken one tack to build a significant amount of roadways. 
and we're getting sort of a middle of the road uh, outcome. And what this really says to me is that, you know, it's great. A lot of those are built through, you know, federal funds, other types of funds. Um, but eventually all of this is sort of a burden that we all have to pay from a fiscal standpoint, that each of us is responsible for a lot more roads. And with those roads come things like the utilities that run along them, the sidewalks, the uh, lighting, you know, all those things that translate into incremental costs. You can see that less in Sugarland, but in the general region in the quality of some of the roads that we have, that it becomes over time much more difficult to maintain uh, those, those uh, 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 facilities. So when you think about congestion in Houston, what, I mean, tell me some place that you think of as, as incredibly congested. Is there, is there anyone that jumps out to you? Galleria. Galleria? And a medical center? 59 and Kirby. 59 and Kirby? Because it's under construction or all the time? All the time. No. Um, I, I'll tell you, you hit on the two that jump out almost always. One of them is the medical center. And what I'd like you to focus on here is sort of the yellow lines. Those are the uh, major arterials in and around the medical center. And you can see that, I'll show you a series of pictures of different areas. There are, are relatively few and there's large developments that make it so that it's, it's difficult to sort of disperse traffic. Everyone ends up on relatively few streets. And that's more of that uh, sort of right side development pattern than I showed earlier. Uh, the other one is the Galleria. There's only really three streets that cross 610 through the Galleria, you know, sort of Richmond, Westheimer, and San Felipe. It forces everyone onto those streets, driving traffic on all of those streets up significantly, and doesn't give people a lot of choices and options. Downtown, on the other hand, there's, it's actually harder, some people will say it's hard to get into downtown, but once you're in downtown, the relative volume on any one of those streets is quite low because it distributes across the grid. And this is sort of the point I was making about um, those, those connected roadway patterns actually have higher capacity uh, than some of the less connected roadway patterns. And sort of one of the things I want to talk about is Sugar Land Town Center and what we're here to talk about tonight. This is at the same scale. Now, which one of those earlier patterns does Sugarland Town Center look more like? Is it more like downtown, or is it more like the medical center, or, uh, or, or the, yeah, so it's like the, med, you know, it's relatively few choices of roads. And one of the things that that's led to is, is a continuing sort of, we're trying to widen State Highway 6. We're trying to widen State Highway 6. We have another project to widen State Highway 6. And it becomes a little bit of a hamster wheel of trying to continually keep up with traffic because there aren't that many choices. So this is a map of actually roadway network connect connectivity. You can see the dark areas are places with a high density of connected roads. And thinking about the types of growth that is coming to the Houston region, what, what are the places that are best set up to support uh, that type of growth? And you can see Sugarland Town Center is a much sort of lighter color on here. It's a relatively low uh, sort of connectivity uh, area. And that's something that the city will have to wrestle with as it thinks about the types of development and land use that, um, that are coming. So I want to talk a little bit about regional connectivity. So there's this sort of hypothesis. I don't know that it's necessarily ever been proven, but uh, this guy named Marchetti who came up with, I think he self-coined it the Marchetti constant. I don't know how that happened. But he said over time, people tend to organize their lives so that they spend one hour of day traveling. And he looked at some research from as far back as, you know, sort of uh, very early development, you know, uh, sort of prehistoric up to today, today, and that people sort of organize their lives so that they can make transportation choices so that they spend about an hour of their day traveling. And you can see that the graph on the right shows you the average one-way commute for cities in Fort Penn County. And almost all of them are about 30 minutes. So that says, you know, every day I'm spending about an hour driving back and forth. And that's fairly consistent across large parts of the United States. Um, but the question is, what happens going forward? Now that Sugarland is sort of set up, but there's lots of growth coming, um, what happens in the future? And this is one of the sort of regional models of predicting what kind of congestion are likely to happen on roadways like 59, the Beltway, State Highway 6, 
And then new growth from the Grand Parkway, the widening of 59 out to Rosenberg, which is going to let a lot of new development happen out there because they will organize their life because they can now get places in 30 minutes. New development will come. But what does that? Ha what happens to Sugarland when all that happens? And where do people in Sugarland currently work? Well, most of them work in Sugarland, uh, which is actually a great thing. So when you're thinking about how to have local trips and minimizing travel time, uh, that's really good. But then it's downtown Houston. So how do I maintain that kind of connectivity to somewhere like downtown Houston? It's the medical center. It's Greenway Plaza, it's Uptown, and then it's Stafford. But thinking about sort of if I'm trying to optimize my life about around one hour travel, and I know that over time traffic is going to get uh, much more congested on the ways that I get there, what am I going to do? And what does that present a type of risk or opportunity for Sugarland to think about things differently? Uh, and, you know, we hear a lot about sort of live, work, and play in one community. But what we've seen a lot is that uh, it's actually, it's really easy for one person to do that, but when you end up in sort of a family unit, it's often difficult to have a husband and a wife sort of both optimize around all those things. So we're trying, we, we need to think about that that is something that is, is, we have to have lots of types of choices. So what do I do? Work at home. And that's where uh, Jeremy talked a lot about sort of this uh, entrepreneurial culture, this live work uh, environment. And this is one of the actually fastest growing parts of the journey to work uh, trip pool. A lot of people are starting to work work at home, uh, being entrepreneurial or uh, consultants or uh, you know one-off job, taking one-off jobs. Uh, but other things, you know, more jobs in and near Sugarland, which is something that the city has already started to do. And I showed you that map of how Sugarland has evolved over the last 20 years. But then thinking about roadway capacity. And one of the challenges here is that at, we're at a point where widening roads like US 59 are increasingly difficult, incredibly expensive. So how do we use those types of facilities? And we know we already have a lot of roads. How do we use those roads better uh, to, to provide the types of capacity and choices that people want? And then things like transit and thinking about reliability uh, embedded in those corridors. So why does all this matter? We've talked about some of this already. Growth is coming. And I know that it would be wonderful to say, we have a great city. Uh, we want it to stay exactly like it is. And if we can, that would be fa fabulous. Um, but one of the beauties of our region, and one of the challenges is that we're, being, we're very successful. We have a great number of jobs coming. You have a great city uh, where lots of people want to be. And so growth is going to continue to come for the foreseeable future. So this is I just I think these are fun charts. So here, here's a trivia question, and I, I, if Jeremy had some chocolate, I would give it to you. Um, in 1960, what is the most dense place in the greater Houston region? It's on this map. Galveston. It's Galveston. So think Galveston used to be the densest place in Houston in 1960. Uh, it's not anymore. So you can see how things can change over time. But by 1970, you can see Houston starting to, to really grow. And if I had sort of the growth of the freeway system, so 1960, the freeway system was relatively new in Houston. Uh, you had places like the east end of Houston that had, you know, 50,000 people. The freeway system came in, and now it has about 20, because people moved to places like uh, Sugarland. But you can see by 1970, uh, the growth has come. By 1980, so see Sugarland, it's that gray area. Uh, on the lower left, it's coming. It's, and so by 2000, you can start to see the growth. And it's really the center of Houston has moved, moved west. It's really the sort of center of gravity of population. is more around uptown right now than it is downtown. Downtown's really on the easternmost part of the development of uh, the Houston area. By 2010, you can see it's uh, Sugarland starting to see some real development areas north of Sugarland. Are, are coming. And if you look, and I know you guys know the number of sort of plots and neighborhoods that are being announced and planned and built uh, by 2040. I mean, just look at the kinds of development. And Sugarland is, is right in the heart of that, you know, sort of colored, dense area. So the growth is coming. And then, so thinking about that growth, this is my favorite quote about congestion, and it's Yogi Bear. It said, uh, no one goes there anymore, it's too crowded. And that sort of speaks to the two parts of congestion. One is, it's too crowded because people, it's a sign of success. Congestion is a sign that people want to be there, that it's, 
you know, that you're successful. You know where it doesn't have congestion? St. Louis, Detroit. I mean, they're, they're not the places that have those congestion issues, but Houston does. And so, but there's that fine line that says, well, no one's going to go there anymore because it's too crowded. So we're constantly trying to play and figure out the right balance of what is success and what is a threat to success. And I think Yogi Berra says it the best. Um, but to so the point that was made earlier, you know, we can, trying to just sort of build your way out of it is a little bit of like a hamster wheel or this quote that's often widely, widely said amongst transportation professionals, but addressing congestion by widening roadways is, by, is like addressing obesity by buying a bigger suit or, widen, or big, you know, loosening your belt. Um, it's sort of a sort of never ending challenge and you see that, that you can keep trying to keep up, but, it, but that capacity quickly gets filled up. You can see, I mean, I think about I-10. We, we built a 22-lane freeway. It's already now one of the top 10 most congested uh, corridors in, in the city, or in the state. And if you look at the number of developments that are coming along the Grand Parkway in Katy, it's not likely to get better anytime soon. Uh, and that's sort of that power of, if you add capacity, it will quickly get used. Now, that's a good thing because it supports growth, but it's also a challenge because we can't, you're back kind of where you started. So, I don't know what just happened there. I lost some slides. Um, so what this slide says <laughs> is that, I think what it was supposed to be here is a slide that shows sort of the, the pattern of development in the Houston, or in Sugar Land. Uh, and it shows that about, most of the, the housing stock in, in Sugar Land was built in sort of the 70s and 80s, about half of it. And so that's about 30 or 40 years ago. And that's when, um, you sort of hit your useful life of roadways, utilities, they start to, you know, kind of end. And thinking about a neighborhood needing to have sort of an ongoing economic performance, Sugarland's in actually a really unique place because a lot of the neighborhood, I, th I think the city has done a great job of trying to stay in front of that, but here and other regions need to stay on top of it. And, and it also matters from a land use standpoint. So places, um, you'll have a lot of opportunities to rethink sort of the related development of the commercial that goes with that, because that's actually one of the places that starts to show the decline most uh, clearly. If you drive down Highway 6, you will see a lot of developments that happened in the 1980s. Classic sort of suburban, uh, big box strip mall. Uh, some of them are still doing well, some of them are not. Uh, and there's opportunities to really rethink some of those and look at sort of how can we have a conversation about, is that the type of development that we want to maintain? Is this the opportunity to think about different housing types? Is this an opportunity to create a more connected street grid that's walkable and bikeable? Is this an opportunity to integrate transit into those, those developments relatively easily? And you also have an opportunity as you rebuild those roadways that are reaching the end of their useful life to rethink it. So you can go from sort of a hostile to pedestrian, auto-oriented street to something that's both more beautiful and more walkable, but still maintains a significant mobility for all modes. And often that actually is correlated with stronger tax base, sort of the more beautiful is worth more than less beautiful. And, and so that actually can help reinforce the economic performance of the city. Uh, competitiveness, when we asked people, we did a, another study in the region with Fort Bend, why did you move to Fort Bend? They said, well, I want to be close to my friends and family, but the second most thing is it's close, or I have good access to where I work. And so to the conversation, or what I brought up earlier, how do I, are, are we going to be able to maintain that? And how do we really think through uh, how we do that? Obviously, schools is right out there. I was actually surprised that access to work was above schools, but uh, I think that, that was really interesting. It speaks to the importance of mobility and, and the types of land use that you have. Uh, I feel, I, I, I heard that this chart has to be in one presentation of every session of the land use forum. Uh, this is sort of that Houston area survey uh, results of asking people what type of place do you want to live in? Do you want to live in sort of a single family residential area or an area with a mix of developments? You can debate whether this is actually showing a trend or if it's um, sort of, there's about 50% of people <coughs> consistently that are asking for this type of development. And I think that second piece is really powerful, that half of the marketplace is looking for, for this type of development. And you'll see that sort of, look, uh, this is walkability. And one of the things that you'll see that in is actually the value of homes. People are paying more. They said there's sort of a, I think it's 
$3,000 a home for a point and walk score, something along those lines. People are paying more for more walkable houses or more walkable neighborhoods. And the big driver of that, that is the market talking, saying there aren't enough of these, so I'm going to pay more to live in them. Uh, and so you can see here, see the green areas, and then it sort of correlates with the red areas on this one of the places that are uh, higher in, in sort of uh, a land value, particularly that area in the center of Houston. And then you have places like Sugarland, which are sort of the, and Pearland, uh, that are sort of the premium suburban uh, uh, areas that ha have a, a pretty high demand for, for housing. Uh, health, I'll go through this quickly because we've talked about this already, but the correlation, this is walking to school or walking or biking to work uh, with obesity. They're almost perfectly inversely correlated, uh, and, and we've seen a significant decline in both, both uh, shifts in mode uh, away from walking and biking and a significant increase in mobility. It also affects mental health. So when you walk or bike, those people tend to report being happiest or being sort of uh, lowest anxiety, uh, lowest uh, uh, rates of depression. And that's something that sort of that speaks to the stress that people undertake when they drive to work every day. How am I doing on time? I'm relatively close my way over. Pretty close to your half hour. Okay. So this is, uh, people are getting old. Uh, this is where we are today. This is actually that Fort Bend, uh, uh, this is actually Fort Bend data. You can see the big chunk is 40 to 64 um, by 2040. Uh, almost 25% of Fort Bend residents are going to be over 65. And the thing that I think is really interesting here is all, so that I actually realized that this is me. I'm going to be in that group by 2040. But I, I, there's a good chance that I won't be alive. And there will be a lot of single women that will be older than 65, needing somewhere to live, and needing to be able to get around and thinking about where services are, what kinds of transportation options those people have, and also under 18, who are also people that can't, uh, that can't drive uh, primarily. Um, so the town center, it's a mix of uses. This is, it's sort of a mixed use place, but as Jeremy said, they're sort of separated. There's sort of moats between all of these different types of mixed use, but it's very close to that type of mixed use place that can promote walking, biking, uh, and, and different types of mobility. Uh, and it invites people. There's a, a, a famous planner, he sort of says, when I invite people, I get people. When I invite cars, I get cars. And so you should, if, you should try and invite the type of person or type of vehicle or type of trip that you want. But it also you know, invites significant traffic. And part of it is that so much, all these developments have been uh, put together, and it, it may go back to that idea of thinking about systems, that they've been put together as single unit developments and trying to work and retrofit to think about how they work together. Um, and so you see this almost every day at, at 5.30 uh, on, on State Highway 6. And then the triple F turn. This is, you know, engineers are incredibly good problem solvers. And the real trick on things like land use is trying to define the problem. This is an incredibly elegant solution to a problem that was defined as the level of service at this intersection is very poor. And you know it's got built-in lights in the street, it's triple left turn, it's got signs and ITS, it's won some awards for being a traffic, for a traffic engineering masterpiece. But it also speaks to a different problem, that if we're asking three lanes to turn left, two lanes to turn right, um, you know, that we haven't necessarily given people choices in that roadway network, and we're trying to force all of those trips that are both regional trips and local trips within town center through this one intersection. And so when I'm a pedestrian, this is what I have to face. Jeremy talked about it, trying to get from, uh, you know, if I live here in these, you know, very nice uh, housing units, and I want to go to Whole Foods, and I want to do my shopping, I don't want to drive. It's like a, less than a half a mile. But I, this is an even, you know, I have to cross State Highway 6, and then I have to cross this, which is seven lanes with two right turn lanes, which are sort of the epitome of challenging for pedestrians because people tend to just kind of roll through them, even on a double right turn. And so, you know, I do all that uh, and, and, and I get there and I finally get there and then I get here. <laughs> there's Whole Foods. It's like right there, but there's no way to get there. I actually have to walk almost a quarter mile out of my way. 
to get to the front door of the Whole Foods. So it's sort of thinking about how development happens, the development form, uh, and the land uses, and how they work together to allow uh, you know, people to make the choices that they want to make. So is there an opportunity to think differently? Uh, we shared this as part of one of the studies we did earlier uh, and working with, uh, with Christoph of you know, how over time can you start to think about town square and town center as the heart of Sugar Land, the power of the economic development of Sugar Land, to bring the types of jobs, to think differently about parking, to integrate transit to allow people to make more trips uh, downtown in a reliable, fast sort of way where they can walk, where they can bike, where we're thinking about sort of bridges over 59. And one of the challenges here is that this is retrofitting, and retrofitting is almost always harder than doing it up front. And so, but how, these are the kinds of questions that Sugarland may want to ask itself as it moves forward in the types of land use planning and mobility planning of how do we really create the kind of places that people say we want uh, that are supporting the types of economic development goals uh, that, that the city has and really sort of continuing Sugarland's position as, as the premier place uh, in the Houston region for people to live, work, and play. So with that, I think that is all my, all my uh, slides. I will turn it back over to you. I hope I wasn't too far over my time, but thank you all very much. This is wonderful. Right, Jeff, stay up here. You can actually grab a seat up here and Jeremy come on up. And we are ready for questions. I have blue cards. Is this all right? Yep. You get to pretend to be city council members <laughs> for one evening. Do I get to push the button? <laughs> Abstain. Here's a really good question. This actually came in from Twitter. If you look at Sugarland, or even more specifically, look at an intersection here like 59 State Highway 6, what percentage of the trips you see there are trips within Sugarland, and what percent of those trips are regional trips? I, I think that's a really great question, and, and I, I think probably a significant percentage of them are regional trips. Um, and you will see an increase in those regional trips as things like the um, Riverstone, Sienna's plantation st continue to grow uh, significantly. So you're only going to get more of those types of trips. But, you know, some of the thinking is, is thinking about what are those marginal trips, the trips that actually push that intersection from being a good level of service to a poor level of service, and how uh, you can provide other choices for people to either, you know, take regional trips in a different route, and so that's where things like the Fort Bend Toll Road have, have been successful. Uh, but also think about how people can do the, the park once type of, uh, type of activity uh, that makes those local trips, which are a lot of turns, uh, you know, move those into, into either walking trips or uh, park one trips that, that affect them. But I, I think the answer is probably, you know, 80, 20, like, like most things. But, but it's really those 20% of trips that you may be able to have the biggest impact on moving that, that intersection to a better level of service. Yeah, I would agree with everything Jeff said. I don't know if I should look out here to the camera for the Twitter questions, but um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of communities that face that problem that Sugarland faces on Highway 6, and 80-20 probably is the right rough percentage of regional versus local trips. And there's a few options. Uh, you know, you can play around with signal timing and intersection design and try to squeeze a little more efficiency out of, out of your system and slightly temporarily improve conditions for vehicles. Uh, you can uh, find a parallel route. That doesn't seem to be an option, uh, that's to my knowledge, but you can't uh, really uh, force the traffic to go around, uh, the regional traffic. Uh, local communities can put up a roadblock uh, or you could do a, a sort of a fiscal roadblock, financial roadblock, block, which is congestion pricing. That's not a local decision, though. That'd be a regional decision. So, I mean, you think about where the congestion is. It's during peak periods of time. I, I came in at midnight from uh, Continental, Intercontinental Airport. There's no congestion at midnight, right? So we're talking about congestion for an hour, two, three hours a day, depending on the day. Uh, so um, uh, congestion pricing might be a strategy at the regional level that um, is worth pursuing or evaluating for peak period uh, tolling. Uh, and then I would say that the most locally viable and doable uh, strategy 
is, as Jeff mentioned, uh, to sort of take the bull by the horns and uh, sort of seize the day or whatever metaphor you want to use and reduce your local trips. You have very little control over regional trips except to be a strong advocate for regional transit uh, and, and, and other uh, traffic reduction measures at the regional level. But you have a significant amount of control over local trips. And so if you can, again, uh, as I showed the graph and, uh, and others may have shown the graph, that uh, if you can just reduce vehicle trips a little bit, you can have a significant, uh, disproportionately high benefit on travel times and, and congestion delays. So you don't, have to, you don't have to reduce the regional trips, you can try to reduce your local trips. Okay. Um, based on what you've seen in Sugarland, and Jeff, how you've worked in Sugarland, um, what thoughts do you have on what kinds of public transit could be helpful in Sugarland? Well, I think, First and foremost, um, you know, Sugarland does have a, a, a park and ride system, and and one of the things about transit that it tends to work in places, uh, sort of local transit tends to work in places that have the sort of a density, and density is really just a measure of people and jobs over a certain area, and you need a certain critical mass of uh, of of density to have to let local local transit actually be sort of cost competitive. Uh, certainly you can make choices to, to subsidize it further, but uh, right now I, I would guess that the best sort of bang for the buck that Sugarland would have is trying to integrate uh, a park, park and ride type service into places like Town Center or places like Imperial that where people can live, uh, walk, take transit to their job and maybe that, that transit can also provide services uh, locally while it's picking those people up. So it does a little bit of both. But probably the, the most impactful in the near term for Sugarland uh, would be some type of regional uh, commuter transit. Yeah, I, I would agree in terms of the peak hour trips, the commuter transit, but then uh, a local circulator might be something worth pursuing. I know one was implemented during a holiday shopping season, had low ridership. Uh, was a pilot project. I was talking with city staff, thinking uh, maybe it's just I'm not um, I'm not acclimated to heat and humidity. But my thinking is that um, a shuttle in the summer might be more successful because there's a lot of destinations, as we've talked about, with the existing street grid that are um, feel too far to walk, even though the distance is quite short. But the conditions uh, and level of amenity for walking is quite low, and you add heat and humidity on top of that, and it's a, it's a tough sell to walk there, even though you can see the sign. Um, across the freeway, uh, but it's it's sort of too close to drive, even if you drive all the time. And so to supplement that park once concept of town center or Lake Point or other uh, activity centers, um, thinking about a shuttle in the summer and um, working with employers to either, and, and the city as a partner and maybe school district or, or uni uh, University of Houston, thinking about who can help partner on that to provide a direct financial subsidy or to market that and incentivize their employees to take it, those kinds of things um, might be a way, to, again, to focus on the non-peak local trips. Jeremy, since we're talking about um, public transportation, can you think of some other examples of suburban cities mm -hmm. that have gotten public transportation links that have benefited economically from those links? Yes. Uh, again, I'm sort of a California biased, having worked there for over a decade, and particularly the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Walnut Creek, I showed pictures of Walnut Creek. They're downtown. They coupled changes in their parking. Uh, management, both on-street, uh, off-street public parking and parking requirements for new development, with the um, rethinking of a downtown shuttle circulator, um, because the two go hand in hand, uh, even without heat and humidity. Uh, being able to park your car and then catch a shuttle to two or three or four destinations that routes you back to your where you parked your car or within a block or two um, is kind of a, the push-pull. Um, and so uh, Walnut Creek is an example. Uh, and again, not only an example of shuttle, uh, local shuttle, but also um, coupling parking uh, reform along with transit service. And they, frankly, they fund some of the shuttle with uh, charges for uh, public, uh, public parking. Um, so that's a one 
funding source. Another example is the uh, Emery Go Round in Emeryville, California, in the Bay Area. They take a they have a local shuttle that connects their shopping areas with um, regional rail transit. So in this case, it might be the park and rides, um, but they connect to the regional transit system with a local serving shuttle. Um, and Emeryville has one of the highest. Emeryville and Walnut Creek actually have among the highest sales tax per square foot in, in terms of commercial real estate values um, in the Bay Area. Just w one thing I want to add on that, I mean, one of the things that we, we've seen in these, over the last 20 years, Sugarland has really become a job center. And it's not so much always about trying to get out of Sugarland to other places, but it's about allowing people to come into Sugarland from other places. And so one of the things is trying to work with uh, sort of regional partners to create two-way transit. Uh, that allows sort of access to the growing, you know, the Minute Maids and other, uh, the medical facilities that Sugarland has has developed over the last few years. Um, uh, you both hit on parking a little bit. If you look at a mixed-use center like um, t Town Square right here, what happens if the parking demand for all of the uses peaks at once? If you're trying to share parking between uses, do you have instances where it all simply breaks down because everyone's trying to get there at once and you don't have the capacity to handle it? I mean, I, I'm sure we could create a scenario where, you know, like I think about an event like Christmas in, in, uh, in town center where all of the parking tends to peak at once. But it's very difficult to, I mean, the types of uses that are here, the office, the, you know, the, the you know, so you have lunch peaks and you have evening peaks. Those tend to offset with, uh, with some of the office. The residential has different times. Uh, the mall has different times. Uh, and so I'm, I know that there are possibilities that that could happen, uh, but that is, again, both a sign, if, if all of the parking in, this, in here, which I think I said was 45% of the land is full, that's a great problem to have. You're doing incredible economic activity. Um, and so, you know, but it is, I guess it is theoretically possible that it could happen. Yeah, the same scenario could happen in an environment where you're not sharing parking. Right, so, uh, so you know, sharing like I said, mentioned in my presentation, there's no silver bullet to any of these issues. If it was, we'd patent it and we'd be millionaires, right? There's it's it's a number of strategies. So, there may be certain uses or combination of uses that don't share well um, uh, in terms of their parking demand, but that's uh, that's better than um, having s standalone parking requirements for each use. Uh, uh, that, that for those uses that can share, we at least with shared parking districts uh, allow that to happen. So you squeeze efficiency out of the system where you can to reduce the nearly half of town center, as successful as it is, to reduce the nearly half of the land area that's covered or that's uh, devoted to parking. Okay, I'll ask one last question since I want to make sure everyone out here gets a chance to have their say. Um, some, both of you have talked about the idea of introducing new transportation modes into a fundamentally car-oriented place. And that requires local decisions that can be made on a city level, and it also requires regional decisions. And the benefits of those decisions do not necessarily happen immediately. So what, what would you be your advice on what a place like Sugarland could do by itself and working with its neighbors to sort of build a sustained effort, build the political will behind that effort um, to, to make these kind of changes? I mean, I, th there's lots of sort of, I think it is sort of as many things as possible kind of approach. Uh, one is trying to create examples that you can point to of success. So one of the reasons I think people talked about the comfortable with mixed use in Sugarland when we asked was that they knew Town Square existed and that it was a great example. So trying to create opportunities for better bicycle facilities, great pedestrian environments, great streets, uh, and, and, and trying to explain those as sort of the fiscally responsible way to use a scarce public resource, which is right of way, to, to create the greatest benefit for the most amount of people, um, I think is really powerful. I think also sort of pointing to some of the facts um, and showing what the challenges are, maybe not today, but that are likely to be coming, uh, and making sure that working with neighborhood neighbors like uh, you know, Sugarland success is at least partly driven by what, uh, the success of the Houston region. So, trying to think and work partner with Houston, 
with Missouri City, with uh, you know Richmond Rosenberg, which you know are starting to really see significant amount of growth. To think about regional solutions like regional transit, uh, while also doing the sort of tactical uh, local improvements to use the resources that Sugarland has uh, the best it can. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say on the political will side, uh, to the aspect of your question. I mean, some of the graphs that that you and Jeff showed. To me, the survey questions as part of the mobility plan suggest the political will is already there. Um, I mean, obviously there, there's a number of ways to interpret data and survey responses, but based on those graphs I saw, this is a community that's already said it wants more mobility choices. And now it's a question of um, translating that political will into um, execution which execution requires, of course, funding and, and planning and all of those things. So it's really more of, a, it's more of an execution question at this point, in my opinion, uh, than, than building support for biking, increased biking and walking. Um, if I were to make a pitch to a skeptical resident or business owner or property owner of Sugarland of why they should put some muscle and some tax base behind ped bike improvements and transit service, I would say, when you or your parents uh, can no longer drive, either by choice or because DMV takes your license away, um, how are you going to get around in Sugarland? Are you going to have to have? Are your kids going to have to ferry you everywhere? Um, are you going to stay at home all day long? You know, how are you going to get around when you can no longer drive? Because that day will come. Uh, or are you going to have to move from Sugarland because it's, it's a, a community that's. But just because it, it was built on the automobile, I guess I would say, uh, means doesn't mean we have to continue down that path. Uh, and secondly, around uh, uh, focus on focusing on kids. When your kids, uh, you may take them to and from school, or they may be able to walk and bike to school. When they uh, move away for school or for college, um, they're as we've seen some of the graphs, the millennials, the young professionals, they're making residential locational choices based on the uh, quality of uh, public places and the mobility choices. They don't want to spend an hour or two a day in a car. Uh, so when your kids come, uh, graduate from college and are looking for a place to live, whether it's a high quality apartment or their first home, um, are they going to even consider living near you? Or are they going to live somewhere far away, not because they don't want to see mom and dad, of course, uh, but because they, it's, you haven't built the community that they want to live in. So that's how I would pitch uh, a, a sort of a multi-generational mobility uh, pitch to build political sort, support. And the last thing I would say on execution just quickly is um, I was reading through the bike ped plan and it has a $40 million uh, cost associated with it approximately for all the improvements that were uh, identified in the adopted bike and ped plan. Uh, based on grants and uh, some potential uh, local funding sources that must be approved by voters, there's still a $23 million gap, funding gap, right? And so when I hear about things like uh, widening Highway 6, which I would say even if you support it, you have to acknowledge it's a short-term and uh, one would say a, a diminishing returns, uh, a, a diminishing yield strategy. Even if you widen it, you're going to get an incremental benefit. And at some point, that benefit uh, it exhausts itself, and it's a, a as, as Jeff pointed out uh, so eloquently, that that incremental benefit is pursued at a very high per trip accommodated cost. So I think about the acquisition required, uh, land acquisition, and the relocating utilities and the capital costs of doing that, even though it's partially funded through external sources. And I think if those funds were used to essentially implement your bike and ped plan in the next three to five years, just to be crazy in terms of a timeline, what, the, what Sugarland would look like in the, at the end of those five years. You're still going to have bad traffic on Highway 6 at peak hours. You're going to have that even if you widen Highway 6 within a few short years. So that's going to happen. It's, it's going to be a, a nominal change. But you'd have a fully built out ped and bike network. So that's just an, a, an example of the political will is there. The support is there. It's a question of execution at this point. Okay, well, thank both of our speakers. Um, and now we want to hear what you have to say. We have tables set up in the conference. Oh.